Good morning, everyone. Um, it's now 10 a.m. East Coast time, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the second day of our ACIP meeting. Today is February 24th, and I'm pleased to call our meeting to order. I will now proceed with roll call for the members only. Um, ACIP members, um, let me just make sure I have my list. Uh, today, I'm going to go in alphabetical order to make it easier for everyone. <laughs> we'll start with Dr. Alt. My name is Kevin Alt, and I'm an obstetrician gynecologist at the University of Kansas Hospital in Kansas City, Kansas, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Alt. Ms. Bata. Good morning, Lynn Bata, Immunization Clinical Co Consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, Clinical, Def uh, Clinical Professor, Department of Global Health, University of Washington, no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Brooks. Uh, Oliver Brooks, Pediatrician and Chief Medical Officer, Watts Healthcare Corporation, Los Angeles, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Morning, Dr. Brooks. Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, my employing institution, the University of Maryland, received a grant from Emergent Biosolutions that supported work I conducted to develop a Shigella vaccine. This does not constitute a conflict of interest on discussions for today. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Dr. Sineas. Good morning. I am Sybil Tineas. I am an internist and pediatrician, associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Warren Albert Medical School, Brown University, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Tineas. Uh, Dr. Daly. Matt Daly, pediatrician and senior investigator at Kaiser Permanente Colorado and associate professor, University of Colorado School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Dr. Cotton. Good morning, Camille Cotton. I'm uh, the Clinical Director of Transplant and Immunocompromised Host at um, Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Lair. Jamie Lair, owner of Cuga Family Medicine, a private family practice in Ithaca, New York. I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Um, this is Grace Lee, Professor of Pediatrics, Stanford University School of Medicine, Associate Chief Medical Officer, Stanford Children's Health. I have no conflicts. Dr. Long. Yes, good morning, Sarah Long, Pediatric Infectious Diseases and Professor of Pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia. I have no conflict. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally, President of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Morning, thank you. Dr. Paling. Good morning, Kathy Paling. I am Professor of Pediatrics and Epidemiology and Prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist. I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Morning, I'm Pablo Sanchez. I'm Professor of Pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. I'm a neonatologist and pediatric infectious disease specialist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus. I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. Good morning. This is Kip Talbot from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where I'm an associate professor of medicine and infectious diseases, um, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wharton, we have all of our members present this morning, so um, we can move to agency updates next. Um, and I will ask, doc oh, Dr. Wharton, did you want to chime in? Are you good? Uh, we're good. Okay. Uh, please proceed with the agency. Okay, <laughs> so we'll, go we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Sam Posner from the CDC. Dr. Posner. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Lee. Um, I have a several announcements, starting with staffing announcements. Um, Dr. Rima Kabaz will be retiring after 38 years of service at CD2. She has been the director of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases for the last five years. She will be leaving at the end of March. And the deputy director, Chris Braden, will take over as acting uh, director for NCEBID uh, at that time. Um, in the National Center for Immunization Respiratory Diseases, Althea. Dr. Althea Grant Lindsay is currently uh, serving as the acting deputy director for science in NTIRD. And in this role, she leads uh, special cross cutting projects that connect and improve the center's surveillance at the and laboratory and data science programs. And she's very involved in the transition activities with the, the response. Um, in terms of COVID 
vaccine implementation updates. CDC provides daily updates on COVID-19 vaccine distribution and administration on the uh, CDC COVID data tracker website. As of February 22nd, more than 686 million doses have been delivered and more than 549 doses have been administered with more than 214 million individuals being fully vaccinated. Since the recommendations of the Pfizer BioNTech uh, COVID-19 vaccine for children ages age 5 to 11, more than um, 9.2 million individuals in that age group have received their at least one dose of the, the COVID vaccine. Um, updated guidance has been posted for the extended intervals to the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine primary series and the interim clinical considerations. We are in the process of updating uh, other CDC web pages and materials to reflect this. Everything should be updated shortly. Um, moving to uh, current efforts on maintaining childhood vaccination cover coverage. Provider ordering of publicly purchased vaccines for fiscal year 2022 has decreased 7% from compared to FY 2019 orders in FY 2020. Overall, non-flu vaccine orders decreased by 15% with a significant drop for vaccines administered to children and adolescents. As of January 8, 2022, flu vaccine coverage for children aged six months to 17 years is approximately 50%, which is almost three percent points lower than the previous season. Um, CDC ha has developed information for parents and providers, such as the well child visit and recommended vaccination communications campaign that encourages parents to prioritize the needed catch the need to catch up their children on routine vac childhood vaccination. And CDC has issued a number of calls to actions in August and October of 2020 and March of 2021 to address uh, drops in routine childhood immunization to numerous partners, immunization programs, and providers. Um, in the influenza seasonal update, seasonal influenza activity um, resumed, resumed in 2021 to 21-22 season and flu activity increased over the fall and through the week ending December 25th, 2021, but then began to decline. In the last week or two, there has been some slight increase in, in flu activity. Flu activity is difficult to predict. Flu may continue to circulate for a number of weeks with the majority of the flu viruses detected this season being the AH3N2. Preliminary data suggests that the vaccine effectiveness against currently circulating AH3N2 viruses may be reduced this season. However, vaccination still likely protects, offers protection, and including against serious flu illness and death. Flu vaccination coverage is lower this season compared to last season, especially among certain high risk, higher risk groups such as pregnant people and children and racial and ethnic disparities persist with lower vaccination rates among non-Hispanic Blacks, adults and Hispanic Latino adults compared to the non-Hispanic white adults. Getting an influenza, an annual influenza vaccine is the best way to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community against flu. CDC continues to recommend flu vaccination as long as flu activity can, uh, continues. Um, as far as seasonal influenza vaccine distribution, for the 21-22 season, vaccine manufacturers have projected they will provide as many as 188 to 200 million doses of influenza vaccine for the U.S. market as of February 11th. Approximately 175 million doses of flu vaccine have been distributed. And in the area of measles and rubella elimination re-verification, the Pan American Health Authority Health Organization's annual meeting of measles, rubella, and congenital rubella syndrome elimination regional monitoring and re-verification commission took place in November, the end of November, beginning of December, and the commission noted declines in the surveillance in nearly every country in the region that, and that the decline in measles and rubella suspected cases in 2020 is likely due to decreased importations and social distancing, which may lead to false sense of security in the region. The U.S was verified for uh, 
verified as sustaining elimination in all countries in the region, including Brazil, which lost status in 2019, and Venezuela, which lost status in 2018, were certified as having maintained measles and rubella elimination. And then finally, in response to um, measles among Afghan evacuees <clears throat> in 2021, the U.S. government implemented a rapid response to quickly interrupt um, measles virus transmission among Afghan evacuees during Operation Allies Welcome, in which CDC provided <clears throat> immediate guidance to OAW uh, implementing par partners to prevent measles transmission among evacuees and domestic and internet at domestic and international bases due to, to an ongoing outbreak and low vaccine coverage in Afghanistan and close living quarters uh, during the process of evacuation, evacuating people in the United States. After cases were confirmed, um, a CDC directive on September 14th called for mass vaccination of measles, mumps, and rubella and varicella reaching, and they would reach approximately 100% of the coverage followed by a 21 day quarantine period and a pause in evacuation flights, as well as vaccines for polio and COVID-19, which limited measles cases to just 47 among the 70,000 plus uh, Afghan evacuees without any deaths or community infection. And then according to preliminary data, a total of 49 measles cases uh, were reported in the five jurisdictions in 2021. And that is it for CDC uh, updates. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fosner. And um, those were really robust updates. I just want to take a moment to, you know, thank the CDC for continuing to manage the unbelievable range of activities and responsibilities that you have. Um, it's hard to remember sometimes um, how much the CDC is doing to protect the health of our populations um, in addition to addressing the pandemic. Um, and then just a quick congratulations to uh, Dr. Kabaz. Uh, you know, we send our well wishes from the committee. Um, and wanted to just um, highlight uh, and thank the CDC for continually updating the guidance on COVID-19 vaccines, particularly the updates on the uh, interval issue. Um, with that, we'll move on to our uh, updates from Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, Ms. Hans, I believe you're on the phone. I am, thank you. I have three updates, um, all of which are from the Medicaid perspective at CMS. Um, the first, I just want to build on Dr. Posner's um, comments around both the COVID-19 vaccine as well as improving the rate of pediatric vaccines. We are committed to working to increase immunization rates for both of those types of vaccines, and we really appreciate that CDC has made themselves available to speak to different groups at CMS. For example, just this week, um, CDC spoke to our um, monthly call with state Medicaid directors and highlighted the changes around um, the COVID-19 vaccinations, which we greatly appreciate. And in January, they, um, CDC also gave a presentation to the state children's health insurance program directors and highlighted both the COVID vaccine, but most importantly, the need to continue to push to catch up on pediatric immunizations. So we will continue to look for opportunities to amplify those messages, but greatly appreciate CDC's support and willingness to, um, to speak so regularly to the Medicaid and CHIP um, state staff. Um, shifting to a couple different updates, um, wanted to mention that on February 11th, we issued an updated Medicaid COVID-19 toolkit which um, addresses Medicaid policy for coverage and reimbursement of COVID-19 vaccines. And that is available on the Medicaid.gov um, website. The other thing I wanted to just mention is that um, in December, on December 2nd, we announced that state Medicaid agencies are now required to cover vaccine counseling visits where a vaccine is not administered. For most children enrolled in Medicaid up to age 21, under the early and periodic screening diagnostic and treatment benefits. Um, so because of this change, we will now consider um, certain COVID-19 vaccine counseling visits for children and youth to be COVID-19 vaccine administration. And for those visits, um, state expenditures can be federally matched at 100%. And I'm gonna um, 
not go through the details of the coverage period under the American Rescue Plan because it's complicated, but just note that it's under the coverage period for the American Rescue Plan, and there is additional information available on Medicaid.gov. And those are the CMS updates. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those important updates. Uh, we'll move next to the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Fink. Hi, good morning. This is Doran Fink for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Vaccines. Uh, we do not have any new uh, emergency use authorizations or approvals of uh, vaccines to report since the last time uh, ACIP met. We uh, continue our active uh, and ongoing review of uh, several uh, uh, submissions for emergency use authorization of uh, COVID vaccines. Um, as well as uh, review of uh, biologics license applications and supplemental biologics license applications for various COVID and non-COVID vaccines. And we expect to be able to provide uh, updates uh, on regulatory actions related to at least some of these ongoing reviews uh, the next time that ACIP convenes. In the meantime, we are also uh, continuing to be actively engaged with uh, public health authorities and uh, international uh, regulatory authorities uh, to uh, work out uh, considerations and policy uh, to address uh, emerging data uh, related to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, needs uh, for further development and, and uh, authorization of, of COVID-19 vaccines to address the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink. Uh, we appreciate your service as always. Um, next, we'll have Health Resources and Services Administration. Dr. Rubin, are you on the line? Yes, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to provide updates on the Division of Injury Compensation Programs. Regarding the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, VICP, the VICP continues to process an increased number of claims. In fiscal year 2021, petitioners filed 2,057 claims with the VICP and nearly 208.3 million was awarded to petitioners and 36.5 million was awarded to pay attorney's fees and costs, which includes um, compensated and dismissed cases. In fiscal year 2022, as of February 1, petitioners filed 327 claims with the VICP and nearly 82 million was awarded to petitioners, including attorneys' fees and costs. In addition, the, as of February 2022, the VICB had a backlog of 1,462 alleging vaccine injury awaiting review. Regarding Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, CICP, as of February 1, 2022, 6,540 claims alleging injuries and deaths from COVID-19 countermeasures have been filed with the CICP, including 3,700 claims alleging injuries from COVID-19 vaccines. More information about the CICP can be found at the website. And that's it for my updates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. Next, we have Dr. Clark from the Indian Health Service. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Like other healthcare delivery systems, the Indian Health Service continues to confront the challenges of the current pandemic and its impact on both routine and SARS-CoV-2 specific immunization efforts. As it has done since September 2020, the IHS COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force coordinates the distribution and administration of COVID-19 vaccines agency-wide, including at federal direct care facilities, as well as at the tribal health programs and urban Indian organizations who elected to receive vaccines through the IHS jurisdiction. In collaboration with our federal, tribal, and urban Indian organization partners, IHS Vaccine Task Force efforts support an efficient system of distribution, prioritization, communication, administration, data management, and safety monitoring for approved and authorized COVID vaccines across 356 federal, tribal, and urban facilities. The IHS has prioritized equitable access to COVID vaccines throughout Indian country. As of February 21st, 2022, within the IHS jurisdiction, over 2.7 million COVID vaccines were distributed and over 2.1 million were administered by participating federal, tribal, and urban facilities. According to current CDC tracker data, among the estimated 2.1 million people served at IHS facilities, 
41% are fully vaccinated and 28% of those fully vaccinated have received a booster dose. IHS will continue its efforts to maximize COVID vaccine coverage rates, especially among the most vulnerable members of the tribal communities which we serve. Across our three surveillance systems to date, IHS COVID vaccine safety monitoring has demonstrated a reassuring safety profile consistent with other national vaccine safety surveillance systems. The IHS routinely collaborates with the CDC and engages with tribal leaders in support of vaccine confidence among American Indian and Alaska Native service population. Routine tracking of IHS pediatric immunization coverage indicates a decline in vaccine coverage for children and adolescents, which has been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Beginning in the spring of 2021, the IHS initiated a pediatric immunization initiative called Safeguard Our Future, Protect Tomorrow, Vaccinate Today. Communication strategies have included blog posts, a parent toolkit, and educational webinars to highlight the topic and to share best practices. Meanwhile, information technology tools and training sessions have helped users to identify and reach out to patients missing recommended vaccines. In addition, IHS facilities have been invited to participate in a quality improvement project targeting changes in immunization workflow to support improved and sustained pediatric vaccination coverage. Also during the 2021-2022 influenza season, the IHS immunization program continues to organize educational webinars, dissemination of ACIP influenza vaccine recommendations, coordination of supply chain logistics, and distribution of facility resources in support of the Influenza Immunization Action Plan. Finally, the IHS Immunization Program is planning to leverage COVID-19 vaccination strategies for the efficient implementation in our service population of new and expanded adult pneumococcal zoster and hepatitis B vaccine eligibility recommendations by the ACIP. And this completes the IHS update. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Next, we'll move on to um, Dr. Beigel from the National Institutes of Health. Yeah, good morning. This is John Beigel from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. I have several updates for the National Institute of Health. For COVID-19, there's been very interesting work in the last few months on defining immune correlates of protection for COVID-19, where NIAID researchers and collaborators found that levels of binding and neutralizing antibodies to the spike correlated with the degree of vaccine efficacy. And, and this was done in the phase three uh, mRNA-1273 COVID vaccine trials, the COVE trials. This was published about a month ago. Um, the results of the heterologous COVID-19 booster vaccine trial was also uh, published. The antibody responses have been previously uh, presented to this committee. Uh, and form the basis of heterologous booster vaccines, but the publication provides additional details, additional time points, and description of T-cell-mediated uh, responses to, uh, to the heterologous booster vaccines, which, as you know, is a critical part of evaluating these, these vaccines. Also, as part of that trial, we assessed neutralizing uh, antibodies to Omicron variant and found that most homologous and heterologous combinations increased humoral immunity to, to Omicron. Uh, there's been additional work uh, improving COVID-19 vaccine uh, uh, immunogenicity in the immunocompromised population. A, a new uh, trial has begun to assess the antibody response to additional dose of an mRNA vaccine in a kidney and liver transplant recipients. Uh, and this study is unique because they are testing it either alone or with concurrent reduction in immunosuppressive medication trying to improve the antibody response. Um, uh, lastly, for COVID-19, an NIH-funded uh, study found vaccinating women against SARS-CoV-2 in the mid to late pregnancy uh, could provide infants with some degree of protection against COVID-19 through the six months of, of age. Uh, looking beyond COVID, there continues to be work on pandemic preparedness, including a uh, workshop on uh, pandemic preparedness in November, NIAID issued a, a new pandemic preparedness plan for future public health emergencies caused by infectious diseases, and there continues to be work towards universal coronavirus vaccines. Details for all of these, as well as uh, several additional updates, will be provided in a written summary. And this concludes the updates from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you so much, Dr. Beigel. Um, and 
Finally, we have Dr. Kim from the Office of Infectious Diseases and HIV AIDS Policy. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to provide ACIP with this update. Um, I'm doing so in, on behalf of the National Vaccine Program and the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Uh, with, the, with contributions from, uh, from a number of federal agencies, many of which are represented at today's meeting, uh, we have prepared a draft vaccine schedule implementation plan. It's a companion document to the National uh, Vaccine Strategic Plan that was released last year. Uh, the implementation plan outlines federal actions in support of our national vaccination goals, and soon there will be a federal registered notice for a 30-day public comment period. Uh, we invite your feedback. Um, we are working to strengthen the case for transitioning three developmental objectives in immunization to core object objectives in healthy people 2030. Uh, these developmental ob objectives are, um, uh, one, increased proportion of women who get Tdap vaccine uh, during pregnancy. Two, increase the proportion of information systems that track immunizations across the lifespan. And three, increase the proportion of adults age 19 uh, or older who get recommended vaccines. Uh, we particularly welcome information exchange from our partners who work on composite adult vaccination data. Uh, with the new ACIP universal hepatitis B vaccine recommendation for adults age 19 through 59, uh, pending publication in, uh, in the NMRWR, of course, uh, OIDP is working with CDC and other partners that are interested in promoting hepatitis B vaccination in routine preventive adult care. Uh, we will be assisting with, uh, with promotional activities. Um, and lastly, the National Vaccine Advisory Committee turned 35 this year, uh, and that uh, met on February 11 and 12, and covered several timely topics on vaccines, including prohibiting discrimination in COVID-19 vaccination programs, COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness, uh, expanding immunization information systems and vaccine safety. Uh, the next NVAC meeting will be on June 15 and 16, 2022. Uh, this concludes my updates for the National Vaccine Program and the OIDP. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. And I want to thank all of our colleagues from the federal agencies um, for their incredible service and dedication. Um, and for your focus on equity and improving the health of our population. We are extremely grateful um, as uh, ACIP members, but also as members of the public uh, for everything that you do. Um, next, we'll move on to the um, pneumococcal vaccine section. So um, I'd like to invite Dr. Kathy Paling, Chair of the ACIP Pneumococcal Workgroup, to provide an introduction and overview for today's session. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, all right, so for the pneumococcal vaccine work group, I want to do the introduction on behalf of the group. Next slide, please. Okay, um, and so we are pivoting from the adult to the child recommendation, and I need to thank um, many um, persons who have contributed to, to the incredible work that's been done. My co-ACIP member, Dr. Sarah Long, our ex-officio officers, Officio members, our liaison representatives and consultants. Um, a special thank you to Dr. Mwako Kobayashi, who's been our incredible CDC lead. Next slide, please. And the incredible work of our CDC contributors and great and ETR consultants. Next slide, please. So to begin, what we're going to do is discuss the summary of the current pneumococcal vaccines the routine recommendations for PCV13, PCV13 catch-up, PCV13 and PCSV23 in series for children 24 to 71 months of age with underlying conditions, and then PCV13 and or PPSV23 for children 6 to 18 years of age with underlying conditions. To get more, more detail, we'll go. And so PCV13, as a reminder, is routinely recommended as a four-dose series at two, four, six, and 12 to 15 months, sometimes known as three plus one schedule. PCV13 catch-up options are for children that are healthy through 59 months of age or children with underlying conditions through 71 months. Next slide, please. All right, now we get into the PCV-13 
13 and PPSD 23 for children 24 to 71 months of age with underlying conditions. The recommendation is to complete the PCV13 series, and that's followed by a PPSV23 at least eight weeks after the last PCV13. Children who are immunocompromised or with sickle cell uh, disease or asplenia um, can receive a second dose of PPSV23 recommended five years after the first dose of PPSV23. Next slide, please. All right, to put this into context, what we've done is shown the underlying conditions in immunocompetent functional or in atomic asplenia and immunocompromised. As you can see, for children 24 to 71 months of age, all are recommended to receive the complete PCV13 uh, series and receive a PPSV23. And you see that for people that have um, functional or anatomic asplenia or immunocompromised, they also can be revaccinated with PPSV23 at least five years after the first dose. Next slide, please. Now we want to turn to PCV13 and or PPSV23 for children 6 to 18 years of age with underlying conditions. For these children, one dose of PPSV23 is recommended for children with chronic heart, lung, or diabetes. One, child, one dose of PCV13 if it hadn't previously been received, followed by PPSV23 at eight weeks for children with immunocompromising conditions, CSF leaks, or cochlear implants. For children with immunocompromising conditions, a second dose of PPSV23 five years after the first dose. On the next slide, we'll see the demonstration. So you can see that um, children six to 18 years of age for CSF leaks, cochlear implants, functional or anatomic asplenia or immunocompromised, they're recommended to receive a complete PCV13 dose if they haven't received it. All of these conditions are recommended to receive PPSV23 and revaccination after five years as the first dose. Um, is for children with functional or anatomic asplenia and immunocompromised. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the reason we're working now is we anticipate PCV licensure in quarter one, quarter two of 2022. We also anticipate PCV20 licensure in quarter two of 23. Next slide, please. So the policy questions proposed by the work group are, should PCV15 be routinely recommended for children less than two years of age as an option for PCV uh, for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, according to the current recommended dosing and schedule? The second one is, should PCV15 be recommended for U.S. children with underlying medical conditions, two to 18 years of age, as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination, according to currently recommended dosing and schedules. What we do want to highlight is the work group is currently not considering any change in recommended pneumococcal vaccine dosing or schedule. That is going to be deferred to the next time we visit this topic. Next slide, please. And so for today, um, the epidemiology of pneumococcal disease and pneumococcal vaccine coverage in U.S. children will be presented by Mr. Ryan Gerke. PCV15 phase three study results in children will be presented by Dr. Natalie Benietis. Grade and ETR for PCV15 use in U.S. children will be presented by Ms. Jennifer Farrar and summary and next steps by Dr. Malako Kobayashi. With that, I'm ready to turn it over to Mr. Brian. Oh, whoops, I apologize. All right, in January, we presented um, the child work group um, initially. So today we're presenting pediatric pneumococcal disease epidemiology, phase two and three PCV15 studies in children, and we're presenting the first part as the evidence to recommendation in grades. In June, we plan to present cost-effectiveness analysis 
and an evidence to recommendation and complete the re evidence recommendation and vote if a vaccine is licensed for use. I believe that is my last slide and thank you. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Ryan Gertie. Thank you. Today, I'll be discussing the current epidemiology of pneumococcal disease and pneumococcal vaccine coverage among children in the United States. We'll begin with a brief background on the spectrum of pneumococcal disease. Pneumococcus is transmitted through airborne droplets from person to person. It can be colonized or it can be colonized or carried in the nasal pharynx and then spread locally to the ears to cause otitis media or ear infections. It can also be aspirated and cause pneumonia. Pneumococcus can also infect the blood and cause septicemia. These different infections can be characterized into non-invasive disease shown above the red line and invasive disease shown below. Invasive pneumococcal disease or IPD is a less frequent but severe form of illness Non-invasive disease is more frequent. In children, otitis media is one of the most common forms of pneumococcal disease. Today, we will review the current pneumococcal vaccine coverage in children and examine recent IPD data, looking at the impact of PCV13 on IPD burden and serotype distribution. We'll review IPD burden caused by serotypes covered in the new conjugate vaccines, PCV15 and PCV20. We'll then review what we know to date on the impact of PCV13 on all-cause and pneumococcal pneumonia among children, as well as recent estimates of pneumococcal inc or pneumonia incidence. We'll also review the impact of PCV13, incident estimates, and serotype distribution among acute otitis media or AOM. Finally, we'll review the serotype distribution of pneumococcal carriage among children. As a reminder, the current pneumococcal vaccines in use and the serotypes covered by each are presented in this table. The 13-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, or PCV13, covers the 13 serotypes highlighted in yellow in the table. PCV13 is routinely recommended for all children aged less than two years, and as mentioned, a dose is given at two, four, and six months of age with an additional dose at between 12 and um, 15 Mr. months. Kierke, I think um, if you're able to get closer to the mic, I oh. think you're coming in and out. That would be wonderful. Okay, Thank you. sure. A catch-up option through age four in healthy children or age five uh, with certain medical conditions is also offered. PCV13 is also recommended for children aged 6 through 18 with certain medical conditions. Additionally, a 23-valent polysaccharide vaccine, or PPSV23, is recommended for children aged 2 years and older with certain medical conditions. Looking at pneumococcal conjugate vaccine coverage among children, coverage has remained consistent in recent years, with over 90% of children receiving three doses and over 80% receiving four doses by age 24 months. Looking at birth years 2017 and 2018, we are not observing declines in vaccination coverage through 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. Although data for birth year 2018 are considered preliminary, and we will continue to monitor this. Next, we're going to look at the impact of PCV13 on pediatric IPD incidence and serotype distribution. Data on IPD are obtained from the Active Bacterial Core Surveillance, or ABCs, which provides population-based surveillance at 10 sites across the U.S. Cases are defined as pneumococcus isolated from a normally sterile site in residents of the 10 surveillance areas, highlighted in blue. Isolates are serotyped at reference laboratories using whole genome sequencing, quellen, or PCR. And for this analysis, serotypes are grouped by vaccine type. And here we include serotype 6C with PCV13 types due to the cross protection provided by the 6A antigen. Before we look specifically at the pediatric population, I want to show IPD incidence rates in children and adult age groups. 
Incidence is highest among older adults and also high among children under the age of five. The incidence is low for children aged five to 17 years and around 25% of cases in this age group have a medical condition that's an indication for PCV13. This graph shows the incident rates of IPD among children under age five from 2007 through 2019. After introduction of PCV13 in 2010, rates of PCV13 type IPD in children less than five, shown here in orange, have declined sharply. Comparing 2007 and 2008 rates to the 2018 and 2019 rates, we observed an almost 90% reduction in PCV13 type IPD. This resulted in a 67% reduction in overall IPD, shown here in blue over the same time period. However, after 2013, declines in PCV13 type IPD rates plateaued at around less than two cases per 100,000 and this trend has continued on through 2019. Rates of non-PCV13 serotypes in black have remained relatively stable over this time period. We're not observing any replacement disease by non-vaccine serotypes in children at this time. We examined IPD rates for individual serotypes in PCV13 plus 6C among children less than five from 2011 through 2019. The serotypes in the original seven valent conjugate vaccine are grouped together in gray, except for 19F, which is shown in yellow. After PCV13 introduction in children, rates of IPD declined for many PCV13 serotypes. However, reductions were not seen in serotypes three, shown here in gray, or 19F, which together accounted for almost 80% of the remaining PCV13 type disease in 2018 and 2019. Serotype 9A, shown in the reddish-brown color, has declined substantially, but still accounts for around 14% of remaining disease. Here's the same graph for older children aged 5 to 18 years. Please note the change in scale on the y-axis compared to the previous slide, since the incidence is much lower among this age group. Similar to children under 5, Serotype 3 and 19F make up most of the remaining PCV13 type disease in this age group, accounting for around 65% of remaining disease, while rates of 19A still accounted for 21% of remaining disease in 2018 and 2019. Now we'll review the current pediatric IPD burden among PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes. This table shows the serotypes contained in the three different conjugate vaccines and PPSV23. Serotypes covered by PCV13 are shown in yellow. Additional serotypes covered by new conjugate vaccines, PCV15 and PCV20, are shown in green. PCV15 contains the 13 serotypes yeah, contains the 13 serotypes in PCV13 plus serotypes 22F and 33F. For analysis purposes, we'll refer to these two serotypes as PCV15 and non-PCV13. PCV20 contains the 15 serotypes also included in PCV15 plus five additional serotypes, which are 8, 10A, 11A, 12F, and 15B. We'll refer to these five serotypes as PCV20, non-PCV15. Finally, there are four remaining serotypes unique to PPSV23, shown on the table in orange. We'll refer to these as PPSV23, non-PCV20 serotypes. This graph shows the incidence of IPD among children less than five, grouped by conjugate vaccine type from 2011 through 2019. PCV13 type IPD in blue decreased after PCV13 introduction in children, as mentioned previously. And in 2018 to 2019, the incidence was around 1.5 cases per 100,000 population. PCV15 non-PCV13 types shown in orange and PCV20 non-PCV15 serotypes in gray have remained relatively stable. And in 2018 through 2019, the incidence due to these serotypes was 1.2 and 
and 1.6 cases per 100,000, respectively. Here's the same graph for children aged 5 to 18 years. Again, note the y-axis is different from the previous slide due to lower incidence among older children. PCV13 type IPD has also decreased since PCV13 introduction in younger children. However, there's some more variability uh, in these older ages, which is likely due to the small rates of disease seen here. In 2018 tw and 2019, the incidence was 0.5 per 100,000. PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes and PCV20 non-PCV15 serotypes have remained relatively stable. And in 2018 through 2019, incidence due to these serotypes was 1.2 and 1.3 per 100,000 population, respectively. This graph shows the proportion of IPD by vaccine type for children less than 5 and 5 to 18 years. PCV13 serotypes, shown at the bottom in light blue, still account for around 20 to 35 percent of IPD in children. PCV15 non-PCV13 type disease, shown in orange, and highlighted in the black boxes accounted for an additional 16 to 17 percent of IPD. Non -PCV, or PCV20 non-PCV15 type disease shown in gray accounted for 13 to 15 percent of IPD and PPSV23 non-PCV20 in yellow accounted for 1 to 5 percent of IPD. Non-vaccine types shown at the top in dark blue accounted for 20 for 32 to 46 percent of disease. Next, I'll review data on the impact of PCV13 on all cause and pneumococcal pneumonia, as well as estimated incidence of pneumonia in children. We'll first review findings from recent studies examining the impact of PCV13 on pneumonia in children. An analysis of U.S. insurance claims data comparing years 2008 and 2009 to 2014 found a 17 to 35 percent reduction in rates of all-cause pneumonia among children depending on the age group, with the largest reductions among children less than two years old. A study analyzing U.S. healthcare claims data for years 2007 through 2009 and comparing to years 2011 through 2012 found a reduction of 17 to 21 percent in all-cause inpatient pneumonia, again depending on age group. However, no reductions were observed in older children aged 5 to 17 years old. The same study assessed changes in pneumococcal pneumonia, finding a 40 percent and 51 percent reduction among ages less than 1 and, 15 and 5 through 17 years, respectively but no significant reductions among ages two to four years. Next, we'll review pneumonia incidence among children. Estimates of pneumonia among children can have a, a wide range for several reasons, including the data sources used, the time period examined, the definition of pneumonia used, and the age of the populations. A recent publication of 2014 U.S. insurance claims data, shown in the first column of this table, estimated the rate of all-cause pneumonia among children to be around 1,300 to almost 4,000 episodes per 100,000 person years, depending on the age group, with the lowest rates among children aged 5 to 17. Based on recent national inpatient sample data, Estimates of inpatient pneumonia among children, shown in the second column of the table, range from around 87 to 680 cases per 100,000 population, again based on age group, with the lowest rates among children 5 to 17 and higher rates in the younger ages. Finally, studies examining pneumococcal pneumonia incidence among hospitalized children under 5, using data from years 2011 and 2012, found a range of 6 to 18 cases per 100,000 population. We'll now review available data on the impact of PCV13 on acute otitis media in children, as well as incidence estimates and serotype distribution. 
Well, first review findings uh, from a recent study examining the impact of PCV13 on AOM in children. An analysis of U.S. insurance claims data from years 2008 through 2014 found a 14% reduction in AOM among children less than or equal to one year of age over the time period. And this is shown on the graph in blue and orange. Older age groups, shown in gray, did not have significant reductions. We'll now review the estimated incidence of AOM in children. Estimates of AOM, like pneumonia, can have a wide range for several reasons, again, including data sources used, time period, definition used, and age of population. A recent publication of 2014 U.S. insurance claims data, shown in this table, estimated the incidence of AOM among children less than five from around 30,000 to almost 50,000 episodes per 100,000 person years, depending on age group. In a prospective cohort study of children in Rochester, U. North, streptococcus pneumonia was isolated from 24% of children aged 6 to 36 months with clinically diagnosed AOM. The same study from Rochester reported serotype distribution among children with pneumococcal AOM. This table shows the proportion of AOM by vaccine serotypes based on specimens collected by either nasal pharyngeal swab, which is noted in the first column as MP swab, or middle ear fluid sample by tamponocentesis, noted in the second column as MEF taps. The serotype distribution among AOM cases with specimens collected by either MP swab or MEF taps are similar, with PCV15 non PCV13 serotypes accounting for between 6 to 8% of AOM in this population. Comparing the serotype distribution of pneumococcal AOM cases found in the Rochester area to the serotype distribution of among IPD cases in the New York State Active Bacterial Core Surveillance Area, which includes Rochester, and is shown here in the third column in green, we observe there's a greater proportion of non-vaccine serotypes causing AOM compared to IPD. PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes contribute to around 6 to 8% of AOM compared to 18% of IPD and the New York ABC surveillance area. Finally, we'll review the serotype distribution of pneumococcal carriage in children. The Rochester Prospective Study of Children with AOM also examined nasal pharyngeal carriage of pneumococcus among healthy children in 2015 through 2019. Children in the Rochester area aged 6 to 9 months were enrolled and followed through 36 months of age, having MP swabs taken during routine well-child visits. Serotype distribution for pneumococcal carriage in the New York study, shown in blue, in the first column of the table. Additional unpublished carriage data was available courtesy of a study conducted by the Georgia Emerging Infections Program. This study was among children aged 6 to 59 months presenting to a children's hospital emergency room in the Atlanta area for any reason. Consenting children had an MP swab taken at time of visit. Serotype distribution for the Georgia study is shown in gray in the second column of the table. The serotype distribution of pneumococcal carriage in children was similar in these two distinct geographic areas. In both study populations, there's a greater proportion of non-vaccine serotypes compared to serotypes causing acute otitis media and IPD. PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes contribute to 3 to 4% of pneumococcal carriage in children in these populations, compared to around 6 to 8% of AOM and 16 to 17% of IPD. In conclusion, among children under 5, overall and PCV13 type IPD incidence has plateaued since around 2013 and 2014. Incidence of IPD caused by 15 PCV15 serotypes has also remained stable. 
In older children, overall IPD rates are small, and even a few cases can impact trends. Among cases in this age group, 25% had a medical condition that was indicated for PCV13. After pediatric PCV13 introduction, all-cause and pneumococcal pneumonia saw modest declines among children, and the impact varied by age group. Burden estimates of all-cause and pneumococcal pneumonia vary across studies. Serotype distribution among pneumococcal pneumonia is unknown in children. Acute otitis media, after pediatric PCV13 introduction, saw modest declines among children with less impact among older children. Burden of AOM in children re remains high, with pneumococcus contributing to a quarter of clinically diagnosed disease. AOM and IPD data show that two additional serotypes included in PCV15 cause 8 to 17 percent of remaining pneumococcal disease in children aged less than five years. With that I'll open up for any questions. Thank you so much. This presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Hahn. Yeah. Hey, thank you for that great presentation and review. I was just wondering on your on slide two where you talk about um, non-invasive versus invasive disease, I think uh, it'd be worth a reminder of those definitions. I think it's somewhat counterintuitive. You know, so many diseases, you think about COVID and other um respiratory diseases that we talk about a lot, it is usually defined um, by severity, so requiring hospitalization and that type of thing. But when we talk about pneumococcal disease, it's, it's invasive disease uh, versus not invasive disease. And it's, it's somewhat uh, counterintuitive because pneumonia, um, it's, uh, I understand the definition. I know the definition of what invasive is, but I think it'd be worth you kind of breeze through that slide. And I think for people just familiarizing themselves with this topic, it'd be really helpful. That's slide two, the second, just the first slide you showed, it was a really nice oh, slide there oops. where you showed uh, what's invasive and non-invasive. And I think since we're reopening this discussion, it'd just be worth a discussion about why pneumonia would not be considered invasive disease because uh, it's so common and so can be so severe. Sure. Yeah, I can review that um, in a little more detail. So it begins, yeah, with, um, you know, colonization, of the nasal pharynx, and so colonization generally precedes disease, uh, and that can lead to, as I said, aspiration, which can cause pneumonia. Now, pneumonia can be uh, both invasive, invasive or non-invasive because um, it can, after causing pneumonia, it can also go on to cause septicemia. So um, we can also, you know, for the purposes here, we've grouped pneumonia, both invasive and non-invasive pneumonia together. But there is a much higher proportion of non-invasive pneumonia than invasive. And then, um, did you want me to go over some of the other um, diseases or anything else additional? No, I don't know if any, anything else, anybody else wants to add anything. Just I think the definition of the isolation from a normally sterile site. Uh, so as you mentioned, a pneumonia with a accompanying positive blood culture would then be considered invasive. Thank you for adding right. that um, yeah, red line. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I think that is helpful because it's a little bit confusing um, at first, I think, to get your head around that when we're so used to thinking somebody in the hospital with pneumonia, pneumococcal disease would have what we would want to consider severe disease, but not necessarily what's considered invasive disease. So thank you. Sorry to go down this path, but I just wanted to quickly. Uh, it took me a while yeah, to get my uh, head around it initially. Okay, yeah, thank th you. Yeah, thanks for um, the clarification. Yeah, right. It's from a normally sterile site is what determines if it's invasive or non-invasive disease. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Um, yeah, could you, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, could you go to the slide with serotypes of pneumococcus from the Rochester study? And, and my, my question while we're getting there is just in the 85% of otitis media that's not caused by um, the identified serotypes. What what are what are what are those what are those serotypes responsible for the large proportion of otitis in those cases? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, while we're going there, yeah, I didn't um, spend too much time on the non-vaccine serotypes, but uh, based on that 
study, and they've been studying the Rochester area for a while. Uh, after PCV13 introduction, they noticed an uptick. Oh, there it is. I'll compare it to invasive. They noticed an uptick in um, 35B, which uh, it, I do have a backup. So I'll show that in a minute. But yeah, 35B, uh, 15B slash C was also a top type, and 23B, um, I believe, also are um, the dominant types in non-vaccine type among AOM. And then I can show um, IPD. I provided the and the backup um, the top non-vaccine serotypes that we're seeing invasive disease. It's there is some overlap, but it's not exactly the same. So here's, um, sorry for the small numbers, but it was just um, a backup slide. But you can see uh, for children less than five, um, 15C is uh, one of the top non-vaccine types. And here we've separated 15B and C. If they're grouped together, 15B and C would be um, the top zero type. And then we do see 23B um, as one of the top ones, which I mentioned is also seen in a lot of AOM cases. And uh, yeah, 23B and 35B, those are both um, ranking high as non-vaccine types among children for both IPD and AOM. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? I don't see any additional hands raised, so I think we will move on to um, Dr. Natalie Banietis from Merck uh, for the next presentation. And if there are additional questions that come up, we'll just ask uh, Mr. Gierke if he'll be available for um, a later comment. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Natalie Benitez, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician and senior director at Merck Research Laboratories. Thank you for the opportunity to present today on behalf of the VU14 team, a high-level clinical overview of the pediatric program. Slide two, please. Next slide. Slide two. I will begin with the rationale for VU14's development, followed by a summary of the phase three pediatric program. The remainder of today's presentation will then focus on the three plus one pivotal study and the safety database. Additionally, I will present in brief conclusions from the supportive studies and the integrated analysis of preterm infants, which are all descriptive in nature. Slide three, please. Since the advent of PCVs, the incidence of invasive pneumococcal disease among children has dropped considerably, mainly due to reductions in vaccine type disease as depicted by the green portions of the bars on the left. However, serotype three, which is included in PCV13, persists and is one of the top serotypes causing IPD in US children in the post-PCV era, as shown in the right panel of the slide. One can also appreciate the relative increase of non-vaccine types, such as 22F and 33F, included among the leading serotypes causing IPD. As such, new PCVs targeting additional serotypes have the potential to further reduce IPD burden among children. Next slide. V14 was developed to expand vaccine coverage to two new serotypes not targeted by currently licensed pediatric PCVs, namely serotypes 22F and 33F. While maintaining or improving upon immune responses to current vaccine serotypes, shared with PCV13 to help sustain the progress achieved to date, all the while ensuring the safety profiles comparable to licensed PCVs. In 2019, breakthrough therapy designation was granted by the US FDA for the VU14 pediatric indication with priority review by both US FDA and Health Canada, underscoring the public health value of VU14. Importantly, the availability of VU14 would introduce a second supplier to the US market which will increase the availability of PCVs for the US population and globally. Of note, V14 was licensed in adults in July of last year, and the anticipated PDUFA date for the pediatric submission is April 1st of this year. Next slide, please. 
The VO one 4 pediatric clinical program was designed to target pediatric populations in which PCV vaccination is indicated and to generate a robust safety and immunogenicity profile for VO one 4 in children through 17 years of age. The phase three program includes nine key studies comprised of approximately 8,500 participants of whom about 5,300 received VO one 4 These nine phase three studies are summarized in this table as follows. In the light blue, three pivotal studies in infants evaluating three plus one dosing in protocol 29 and two plus one dosing in protocols 25 and 26, the latter of which is still ongoing. In the blue, three supportive studies evaluating PCV switch in infants in catch up vaccination through 17 years of age, as well as the large safety study in infants. In the navy blue, three studies in special populations at increased risk for IPD, namely children with sickle cell disease, children live with HIV, and lastly, hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients, a study which is still ongoing. Other ongoing studies in the program include Protocol 32, the AOM efficacy study. Next slide, please. Safety and tolerability evaluation in the program was based on solicited, non-solicited, and serious adverse events. Immunogenicity was evaluated using validated pneumococcal electrochemiluminescence and multiplex OPA assays. The ECL was bridged to the WHO reference ELISA. Evaluation was based on serotype-specific antibody responses, including IgG response rate, that is the proportion achieving an IgG threshold concentration of at least 0.35 micrograms per ml, IgG geometric mean concentration, and opsonophagocytic activity in a subset of study participants. In infants, immunogenicity was measured 30 days post-infant series, immediately prior to the toddler dose, and 30 days following the toddler dose. In children aged two years and up, immunogenicity was assessed immediately before and 30 days following vaccination with a single dose of PCV. Of note, the higher burden of disease in infants under one year of age in comparison to older children underscores the need for strong vaccine-induced immune responses in this age group. As such, the demonstration of non-inferior immune responses to the standard of care licensed vaccine after the infant series at post-dose three is a regulatory requirement for the pediatric indication when licensing new PCVs in the United States. Next slide, please. Transitioning now to the featured phase three pivotal study protocol 29. Next slide, please. Protocol 29 was designed to evaluate the safety and immunogenicity of a four-dose PCV schedule administered at two, four, six, and 12 to 15 months of age. 1,720 healthy infant participants were randomly assigned in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive v 14 4 or PCV13. This study also evaluated the co-administration with licensed pediatric vaccines. Vaccination report cards were reviewed at study visits and via telephone contacts at day 15 after each vaccination and at six months after the last PCV dose. Next slide, please. The primary safety objective is the evaluation of safety and tolerability of the one 4 with respect to adverse events. The primary immunogenicity objectives are the non-inferiority evaluation of IgG response rates and GMC ratios. The secondary immunogenicity objectives include a descriptive evaluation of OPA GMT, as well as non-inferiority evaluation of antigen-specific response rates to the co-administered vaccines. Additionally, a superiority evaluation was conducted for responses to the unique serotypes 22F and 33F and the shared serotype 3. Next slide, please. In this presentation, v 14 is depicted in green, whereas PCV13 is depicted in blue bars. In regard to the primary objective of IgG response rates after the third dose, a conclusion of non-inferiority of u 14 to PCV13 is based on the difference in the proportion of responders between the arms being less than 10 percentage points. And as you can appreciate by the percentage point difference depicted at the bottom of the bar graph and the bolded lower bound, v 14 meant non-inferiority for all 13 shared serotypes. Next slide, please. The responses to the two unique serotypes included in v 14 are shown here. As per regulatory requirement, responses for the unique serotypes in the v 14 group are compared with the lowest observed response rate in the PCV13 group, excluding serotype three. 
In this case, it is serotype 23F at 92%, as shown to the right in the blue bar. V14 meant non-inferiority for the two unique serotypes. Next slide, please. In regard to the primary objective of IgGGMC post dose three, a conclusion of non-inferiority of V14 to PCD13 is based on the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval for the GMC ratio being greater than 0.5. V14 meant non-inferiority for 12 out of the 13 shared serotypes, narrowly missing the predefined criterion for serotype 6A with a 95% confidence interval lower bound of 0.48. Next slide, please. And for the unique serotypes, again, per regulatory requirement, IgGGMCs for the V14 group are compared with the lowest observed IgGGMC in the PCV13 group, excluding serotype 3, which in this case is serotype 4 at 1.4 micrograms per ml. V14 met non inferiority here as well. Next slide, please. Switching now to the toddler dose, as you can appreciate here, V14 met non-inferiority criteria for all 13 shared serotypes based on IgGGMC at post dose four with all lower bounds greater than 0.5. Next slide, please. Similarly, for the unique serotypes, V14 met non-inferiority based on IgGGMC at post dose four. Next slide, please. Now we will transition from the primary non-inferiority objectives to the secondary superiority objectives, starting with the post dose three response rates for the unique serotypes. A conclusion of superiority of V14 to PCV13 is based on the difference in the proportion of responders between the arms being greater than 10 percentage points. Here, responses of V14 in green are being directly compared to responses of PCV13 in blue. V14 met superiority criteria for both unique serotypes. Next slide, please. For IgGGMC for the unique serotypes, a conclusion of superiority is based on the lower bound of the GMC ratio being greater than two, that is at least double. V14 met superiority criteria at both post dose three and post dose four. Next slide, please. Switching now to the shared serotype three and response rates at post dose three. The superiority criterion was based on the difference in response rates being greater than zero. With a lower bound of 12.1, V14 met the superiority criterion for serotype three. Next slide, please. When looking at serotype three's IgG GMCs for post dose three and post dose four time points, superiority was based on the lower bound of the ratio being greater than 1.2. V14 met superiority here as well. Next slide, please. Switching gears now to the co-administered vaccines, as can be appreciated by the forest plots depicted for the response rates, all lower bounds met non-inferiority criteria. Additionally, for the IgGGMC to pertussis not shown here, V14 met non-inferiority with lower bounds of the ratios being greater than 0.67 for each evaluated pertussis antigen. Next slide, please. So when considering each of the 15 serotypes in V14 and all the concomitant antigens assessed, V14 met 73 out of 74 individual immunogenicity hypotheses in protocol 29. Furthermore, not presented today is a descriptive evaluation of functional activity at post dose three and post dose four, which demonstrated generally comparable OPA GMTs for the shared serotypes and higher GMTs for the unique serotypes and V14 recipients as compared with PCV13. Next slide, please. I will now briefly summarize the pediatric safety database. Next slide. As mentioned, the pediatric V14 program was designed to generate a robust safety database to characterize the safety profile of V14 in the pediatric population. Today's presentation is focused on the seven studies included in the initial US filing with one phase two and six phase three studies. These seven studies encompass approximately 7,200 children aged six weeks through 17 years, of which approximately 4,800 received V14. About 6,100 were infants enrolled at six to 12 weeks of age, of which around 4,300 received V14. Older children through 17 years of age receiving a single dose of PCV 
were enrolled in three studies, which will be discussed later in this presentation. I will now present the integrated phase three safety results for infants pooled across protocol 31, the safety study, protocol 29, the pivotal study, and protocol 27, the interchangeability study. Next slide, please. The baseline characteristics and demographics of participants included in the integrated safety analysis are comparable between the groups. Notably, the population was diverse with regard to race and ethnicity as shown in the right panel of the slide. slide next slide, please. This slide shows the integrated safety summary with 3,000 in the V14 group and 1,500 in the PCV13 group. V14 safety profile is generally comparable to that of PCV13. The proportions of participants with adverse events, including injection site systemic and vaccine-related AEs and SAEs, are generally comparable between the groups, as shown in the left panel. Solicited events account for the majority of all AEs and vaccine-related AEs in both groups. In both groups, the majority of AEs are mild or moderate in intensity, as shown in the right panel by the green portions of the histogram, with a duration of three days or less in the majority. There were no discontinuations due to vaccine-related AEs in the integrated analysis. Vaccine-related SAEs of pyrexia were reported for two participants in the V14 group. The events were considered mild and moderate in intensity, and both resolved in three days. Four deaths were reported, two in each group, none of which were deemed vaccine-related by the investigators. Next slide, please. The distribution of maximum body temperatures for the integrated analysis was also generally comparable between intervention groups, with the majority being afebrile in the seven days post-vaccination. Of those with temperatures greater than or equal to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, the majority were less than 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit in both groups. Next slide, please. I will now briefly summarize the key conclusions for the supportive studies, which were evaluated descriptively. Protocol 27 is a study of interchangeability, otherwise known as switch or mixed dosing, when the series is initiated with PCV13. Protocol 24 is a study of catch-up vaccination through 17 years of age, with age-appropriate regimens of three, two, or single dose of PCV. Protocol 23 is a study in children with sickle cell disease age five to 17 years receiving a single dose of PCV. Protocol 30 is a study in children living with HIV age six to 17 years receiving a single dose of PCV followed sequentially by PPSV 23. And lastly, infants born prior to 37 weeks gestational age were integrated for a descriptive analysis. The integrated preterm population presented herein are comprised of approximately 290 preterm infants. The youngest gestational age enrolled in the V14 group was 27 weeks, and the distribution of gestational ages between groups was comparable with a median gestational age of approximately 36 weeks. Next slide, please. The overall safety conclusions from the supportive studies and the integrated preterm infant analysis are that V14 is well tolerated and safe in these populations. The overall immunogenicity conclusions are that V14 is immunogenic to all 15 serotypes, both quantitatively and qualitatively, with comparable responses for the shared serotypes and higher responses for the two unique serotypes as compared with PCV13. Next slide, please. And to wrap up with the key conclusions of the V14 pediatric clinical program, next slide. In children with an unmet medical need for pneumococcal disease prevention, V14 is well tolerated with a safety profile that is consistent with licensed PCVs. V14 induces robust immune responses to the 13 serotypes shared with PCV13 without significant loss of immunogenicity. V14 is superior to PCV13 for the shared serotype 3 and the unique serotypes 22F and 33F, which are of high public health importance. Therefore, V14 has the potential to significantly address the burden of remaining pneumococcal disease due to vaccine types and leading non-vaccine types in children. Next slide. This concludes the clinical overview of the pediatric V14 program. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Benides. 
Uh, before we move on to questions, um, I believe Dr. Haupt from Merck would like to add a few comments. Uh, we asked Dr. Haupt the comments are limited to two to three minutes. And you can go ahead and then we'll open up the presentation for discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. Just checking, sound is okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Great, great. Well, good morning. Yeah, it's Rick Haupt. I, I head up vaccines and infectious diseases, medical affairs for Merck. And, and I want to thank you for allowing me to make just a, a couple of comments. Uh, mostly, I wanted to thank the pneumococcal working group um, for all the efforts that were um, undertaken to ensure a comprehensive review of all the evidence supporting the recommendation for PCV15 children. And additionally, we recognize there have been major efforts by the ACIP and CDC to consider the PCV15 pediatric recommendations so quickly, actually, following all the work that was just done and is still ongoing for the adult pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. And that's all been done, especially given the additional work related to the COVID pandemic. So based on a timeline presented today, we noted that assuming licensure, um, a vote for the PCV15 vaccine in, for infants and children could occur at the June meeting. And as we just presented, we did submit the, the data file to the FDA in the third quarter of last year. The FDA granted us a priority view and established the Bidufa date of April 1st. So we will have, we expect to have, I should say, licensure by, by April. And that's important. Um, as many of you know, the, a critical criterion for priority view is, is that um, a medicine or vaccine address an unmet medical need. And as you can see, the PCV15, by including serotypes 22 and 33F, which are not included in PCV13, um, um, offer uh, opportunity to address disease caused by them. And with a superior immunological response against serotype 3, um, may, may provide some protection against serotype 3 as well. So again, thank you. And, and as, as we will continue to do, we will support the working group as they review all the data that are needed to inform the vote that's coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Um, we will open uh, Dr. Benidi's uh, presentation for questions. Dr. Paling. All right, thank you for this wonderful presentation. And um, I, um, I had two questions, and I was hoping you could look at slide 20 with the co-administration. Um, and my question was, um, I'm trying to understand the difference on the left and the right, and in particular on the right, the hip looked like it was lower. Could you help me understand the slide? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Um, to clarify, on the left, um, those are post dose three responses, and on the right, it is post dose four. Okay, and so the interpretation is that there is no significant difference after the third dose with HIB, but there is on dose four. Is that correct? Sorry, but the V1 format non inferiority for the HIB PRP at post dose four. So the responses were comparable between the two um, arms. Okay, I'm trying to understand because it um, doesn't cross the line. Right, sorry, that is the ratio between the two groups. What you're seeing there oh. on the, the forest plot, that is the ratio between V14 to PCV13. I see. Okay. And I think Dr. Fink wants to say something. So I. Um, Thanks. Maybe I could just explain from, from a perspective of, of regulatory approach to this um, non-inferiority testing. So there, there are statistical criteria uh, for non-inferiority testing, but then uh, each of those statistical criteria is, is associated with a, a clinical um, uh, understanding or, or assessment. And so it's entirely possible that uh, 
that that something could uh, that that in a non inferiority analysis, a what we would consider to be a clinically meaningful uh, non inferiority finding uh, could in in a separate statistical analysis um, be a statistically significant difference that we don't find to be clinically meaningful. And so that's what I, I think you're seeing specifically in uh, uh, the, the HIB uh, row on, on the right-hand side. So we, we consider uh, meeting the, non, the pre-specified non-inferiority uh, criterion uh, to be clinically meaningful. Uh, we would not consider the uh, what, what you might uh, say is a statistically significant difference, although with the caveat of uh, multiplicity control, uh, we would not consider that apparent statistically significant difference to be clinically meaningful from a regulatory perspective. Thank you, Dr. Fink. That was really... Oh, Dr. Palin, go ahead. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I wanted to also ask um, about slide 25 when we're looking at um, adverse events. And I want to make sure I understood. So there's um, two serious vaccine adverse events. And if I understood that correctly, both of those were pyrexia for three days. Um, in the V114 um, data. And then I wanted to ask about the four deaths that um, in a two in each group that were said to be not vaccine related. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. For the two pyrexia events, for the first, the onset occurred on the same day as dose one. Maximum body temperature was reported as 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and concomitant vaccines included rotavirus vaccine. HIB and combo vaccine with DTAP, IPV, and Hep B. The second serious event of fever in the V14 group had onset on the same day as those three. Maximum body temperature was reported as 102.9, and concomitant vaccines were oral polio vaccine and a combo vaccine with DT whole cell pertussis and HIB, Hep B. For the four deaths, uh, which were deemed unrelated, the two deaths that occurred in the V14 group one occurred on day two relative to dose three due to congenital heart disease, and one death on day 110 due to dose, uh, relative to dose four due to cranial cerebral injury after a car accident. The two deaths in the PCV13 group, the first was on day 25 relative to dose one from cardiorespiratory arrest due to sudden unexplained infant death, and the second death on day 185 relative to dose two from complications of head injury and septic shock. Does that address your question? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Are there other, other questions? Dr. Daly. Yeah, I had a follow-up question about fever. Um, so what made those fevers designated as serious vaccine-related adverse events? And I guess I asked that in the in the context of a, a later slide where a fever of 105 was reported among vaccine recipients in V114, if I interpreted that correctly. Thank you for the question. Serious adverse event designation is based on specific criteria and hospitalization is one of those criteria. So those two pyrexia events were admitted to the hospital and therefore they constitute a serious adverse event. And in regards to your question on, on the temperatures, the proportion of participants reporting a maximum body temperature greater than 100.4, greater than 104, were low in both groups. And temperatures greater than or equal to 105.8 were reported in 0.2% in each intervention group. Okay, yeah, thanks for clarifying. So that the serious adverse events shown on slide 25 were because those were young infants who were presumably admitted for observation due to their fever, for example. I, I, yeah. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions from members or liaisons? Hey, actually, um, I did have a question, uh, Dr. Benitez. If you go back to the prior slide around the fevers, um, it looks for, oh, sorry. Let's see, slide 26, I believe. 
Um, it does look fairly comparable to me in terms of the fever distribution for dose one, two, and three. I'm just noting for dose four, the height of the fever seems a bit um, uh, different in the V114 group compared to PCV13. Uh, do you, and the reason I ask is partly because that uh, time period tends to be sort of the height of background rate for febrile seizures, for example. Uh, and we've seen that before uh, with concomitant uh, PCV13 and flu vaccines. Uh, do you have a sense of, uh, if you were to take a look at the, um, you know, those greater than 103, if it does feel uh, qualitatively different, number one, and number two, have there been any um, febrile seizures associated? And I guess my third question is, did any of those kids receive concomitant flu vaccine? So in regards to the post dose four um, uh, fevers, uh, indeed, uh, I believe you're looking at the greater than 105.8. Um, but apart from, from those, uh, the temperature distribution is relatively comparable between the groups. And we also have to remember what the concomitant vaccinations um, that are given at, with dose four include MMR and varicella vaccines. Um, in regards to the difference between the arms, it's, it's just a difference of 0.2, and there isn't anything specific um, to explain that in this particular situation. I also want to point out the, the, the ends, the sample size for each of the groups here. For V14, it's around 2,800, and for PCV13, it's around 1,300. So that may explain the discrepancy. Uh, coming to your question about feb febrile convulsions, the rate of febrile convul convulsions in the pediatric program was 0.3% for the V14 arm and 0.2% for the PCV13 arm. These particular events here that you see on the screen were not associated with febrile seizures. And finally, for your last question in regards to concomitant flu vaccination, flu vaccine was not administered concomitantly during the pediatric program. Thank you. And thank you for pointing out the difference in the ends. I'm uh, not paying close enough attention to that. Um, appreciate the response. Any other questions from members or from our liaisons? Okay, I don't see any additional hands raised, so we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much uh, for speaking today. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Farrar from CDC, uh, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the pneumococcal work group, I will be presenting the data and the work group's interpretation on the use of 15-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in children using the evidence to recommendation framework. After discussion with the pneumococcal work group, two PICO questions were decided for PCV recommendations. The first PICO question being considered by the work group is should PCV15 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for U.S. children younger than two years of age? The second question is should PCV15 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for U.S. children aged 2 to 18 years of age with underlying medical conditions? Both policy questions compare PCV15 to the current vaccine recommendations and review the outcomes, vaccine type, invasive pneumococcal disease, vaccine type pneumonia, vaccine type acute otitis media, deaths due to vaccine type pneumococcal disease, and serious adverse events. As a reminder, the ETR framework consists of the following seven domains, public health problem, benefits and harms, values, acceptability, feasibility, resource use, and equity. This presentation will focus on the domains public health problem, benefits and harms, values, and equity. Available evidence is usually assessed for each policy question. However, given the overlap in available evidence for the two questions being considered, we review the two questions in parallel for each ETR domain. The first domain is public health problem. Is pneumococcal disease of public health importance in children? My colleague Ryan presented earlier on the epidemiology of pneumococcal disease burden in children, but I will briefly summarize the burden of disease as evidence for this domain. 
Acute otitis media is one of the most common reasons for outpatient care in children, and streptococcus pneumoniae is one of the most common bacterial causes of AOM. However, administrative data have shown AOM and pneumonia rates in children have decreased over time. IPD rates decreased after PCV introduction in children, but young children are at increased risk of pneumococcal disease. Among children less than five years of age, overall and PCV13 type IPD incidence has plateaued since 2013 and 2014. The incidence of IPD caused by the unique PCV15 serotypes has also remained stable during this time. The two additional PCV serotypes caused 17% of IPD in 2018 and, and 2019. Overall, IPD rates in children aged five years of age or older have remained small and 25% of IPD in children aged 6 to 18 years was in children with immunocompromising conditions. The work group determined that pneumococcal disease is of public health importance in children. The next domain is benefits and harms. This domain will be reviewed for each policy question and cover several questions the first of which is, how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects for vaccine-type IPD, vaccine-type non-bacteremic pneumococcal pneumonia, vaccine-type acute otitis media, and death from vaccine-type disease? The second question is, how substantial is the undesirable anticipated effect for serious adverse events? The third question is, do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects? And the last question is, what is the overall certainty of this evidence for the critical outcomes? We will look at overall certainty regarding effectiveness of the intervention and safety of the intervention. The search strategy included reviewing evidence for PCV15 from clinicaltrials.gov, PubMed, and additional resources provided by vaccine manufacturers and subject matter experts. 71 studies were initially identified. After deduplication and exclusion, seven were, inclu were included for grade. No PCV15, no PCV15 studies directly assessed vaccine effectiveness against the critical outcomes. We identified five randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, evaluating PCV15 efficacy and or safety in healthy children. All five studies are compared to those who received PCV13. The first four studies, highlighted here, provided immunogenicity and safety data. The first study, PLAT 2020, was a phase 2 RCT that compared two different lots of PCV15 with PCV13 using a 3 plus 1 schedule. The second study, V114029, was a phase 3 RCT and the pivotal study for PCV15, and this was, pre this was just presented in depth earlier. As a reminder, this study evaluated PCV15 compared to PCV13 using a 3 plus 1 schedule, as well as concomitant vaccine administration with other routine immunizations. The third study, V114027, evaluated product interchangeability with using PCV13 and PCV15. And the last study, V114024, evaluated catch-up schedules at different ages using PCV15. The fifth study, V114031, was an RCT focusing on safety and tolerability in healthy infants and stratified between full-term and preterm infants. Infants were given either PCV15 or PCV13 at 2, 4, 6, and 12 to 15 months of age. Regarding routine use in healthy children, PCV15 was not inferior to PCV13 for all 13 shared serotypes post-dose 4. Post-dose 3, PCV15 was not inferior to PCV13 for 12 of 13 shared serotypes, with serotype 6A missing the non-inferiority criteria. And this was uh, previously reviewed in, in the last presentation. PCV15 had significant, statistically significant higher immune responses for serotype 3 and 22F and 33F, the two serotypes unique to PCV15. Immune responses for PCV15 were higher compared to PCV13 for serotype 3 and the unique PCV15 serotypes. The certainty assessment was not serious for all criteria except indirectness, 
which was downgraded to serious due to the absence of data on correlates of protection for some of the critical outcomes considered. The overall certainty of evidence is therefore too moderate. The work group determined that the de desirable anticipated effects of routine PCV15 use is moderate. Considerations discussed by the work group include no PCV15 studies directly assessed clinical outcomes. Additionally, there are unknowns such as the clinical implications of improved immunogenicity against serotype 3. However, PCV15 provides additional coverage for two additional serotypes compared with PCV13 if the improved immune response against these two serotypes translates to clinical effectiveness. Five RCTs, which were previously described, evaluated safety regarding PCV15 use in healthy children compared to, with PCV13 use. Five serious adverse events following immunization were reported in the intervention group across all five studies. A pooled estimate observed a higher risk for serious adverse events among the PCV15 group compared to the PCV13 group. However, this was not significant. Regarding the certainty assessment, all criteria were deemed not serious except imprecision, which was downgraded to serious due to few events of the outcome being reported. The overall certainty of evidence is therefore too moderate. Therefore, the undesirable anticipated effects of routinely using PCV15 was determined to be minimal. Balancing the desirable and undesirable effects, the work group determined that routine use of PCV15 was favorable compared with the current recommendation. It should be noted that the vote was split between favors intervention and favors both. Some work group members thought the option favors intervention gave the impression that the work group is proposing a preferential recommendation when the intention is to assess whether PCV15 can be used as an option in addition to PCV13. Based on the certainty assessment during grade, routine use of PCV15 was too moderate for both effectiveness and safety of the intervention. We identified two RCTs evaluating PCV15 use in children with underlying medical conditions compared with PCV13 use. The first study, V114023, evaluated one dose of PCV15 in children with sickle cell disease. The second study, V114030, evaluated PCV15 in series with PPSV23 in children living with HIV. Regarding PCV15 use in children with underlying medical conditions, post-PCV dose, PCV15 had higher immune responses versus PCV13 for six to seven PCV13 shared serotypes and unique serotypes 22F and 33F across both studies. In one study that assessed PCV use in series with PPSV23, Post-PPSV23 dose, PCV15 plus PPSV23 had numerically higher immune responses versus PCV13 plus PPSV23 for three of 13 shared PCV13 serotypes, but not for unique serotypes 22F and 33F. When assessed for certainty of evidence, two of the criteria were downgraded. Indirectness was downgraded to serious due to the absence of data on correlates of protection for some critical outcomes considered, and imprecision was downgraded due to small sample size. Therefore, the overall certainty of evidence is three low. The work group determined that the desirable anticipated effects of PCV15 use in children with underlying medical conditions is moderate. Workgroup discussions regarding this question were similar for both routine use in children less than two and use among children with underlying medical conditions and have been previously mentioned. But as a reminder, no PCV15 studies directly assessed clinical outcomes. The workgroup was split between moderate and large with some uncertainty around the added benefit from PCV15 use, not just from additional serotypes, but also improved immune response against serotype 3. Additionally, there are unknowns, such as the clinical implications of improved immunogenicity against serotype 3. 
However, as mentioned previously, PCV15 provides additional coverage for two additional serotypes compared with PCV13 if the improved immune response against these two serotypes translates to clinical effectiveness. In PCV15 use among children with underlying medical conditions, no serious adverse events following immunization were reported in either study. Regarding the certainty assessment, all criteria were deemed not serious except imprecision, which was downgraded twice to very serious, once due to no events of the outcome being reported, and again for very small sample sizes. Therefore, the overall certainty of evidence is, low, is three, low. The undesirable anticipated effects of using PCV15 in children with underlying medical conditions was determined to be minimal. Balancing the desirable and undesirable effects, the work group determined that using PCV15 in children with underlying medical conditions was favorable compared with the current recommendation. As was discussed for routine use, it should be noted that the vote was, was split between favors intervention and favors both. Some work group members thought the option favors intervention gave the impression that the work group is proposing a preferential recommendation when the intention is to assess whether PCV15 can be used as an additional option to PCV13. Based on the certainty assessment during grade, routine use of PCV15 in children with underlying medical conditions was three low for effectiveness and three low for safety of the intervention. The next domain we'll review is values and preferences. The first question is, does the target population feel that the desirable effects are large relative to undesirable effects? And the second question is, is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcomes? Data on value and preferences of PCV15 use in children were not identified. However, we looked at vaccination coverage for three or more doses of PCV by 24 months of age and found high vaccination coverage, demonstrating that the target population probably feels that the desirable effects of PCV vaccination outweigh the undesirable effects. The work group interpretation was split evenly between probably yes and yes. For PCV15 use, the work group agreed that the target population probably feels that the desirable effects from vaccination are large relative to undesirable effects. The work group's split in responses is likely due to the small potential added impact of PCV15 use over PCV13 use, and not over the uncertainty about whether the vaccine is able to prevent serious pneumococcal disease. For the second question, the work group determined that there is probably not important uncertainty or variability in how people value the main outcomes. The last domain we will discuss is equity. What will be the impact on health equity? We looked at unadjusted IPD rates using AP ABC's data from 2008 to 2019 in two-year increments, which are located along the x-axis, for children less than five years old, which will be shown in the top row, and five to 18 years old, which will be shown in the bottom row, and for different serotype groupings, which are shown as columns. For all serotypes, rates decreased during and after 2010 in both age groups and were sustained over time, except in black children 5 to 18 years. However, please note the small IPD rates in children aged 5 to 18 years in the lower graph. Rate ratios comparing black and white children decreased from the start to the end of the study period in children less than 5, but not in children 5 to 18 years of age, although both sets of rates went down. Decreases in overall rates were driven by decreases in PCV13 serotypes. Overall decreases in PCV13 type IPD in all groups were observed from the start to the end of the study period. Rate ratios in children less than 5 decreased over the study period, but in children 5 to 18, ratios did not, although rates went down in both groups. Non-PCV13 rates remained fairly stable over time in white children, but decreased from 14 per 100,000 to 8 per 100,000 in black children less than 5 years of age, causing the rate ratio to decrease. 
Rates went up in black children 5 to 18 years of age, although the rates are much smaller compared to younger children. There were not big differences by race in the PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes at any point over the study period. In conclusion, racial differences in PCV15 non-PCV13 types are quite small, but PCV13 resulted in large reductions in IPD in both age groups across, um, across races. Um, regarding equity in Native American and Alaskan Native children, IPD rates among Native American children less than five years of age decreased over P after PCV13 use, but rates re remain approximately fourfold higher than in children of all races. Data on Alaskan Native children showed that Alaskan Native infants had a 1.6-fold higher rate of otitis media-associated outpatient visits compared to all infants. And Native American and Alaskan Natives experienced cyclical outbreaks due to serotype 12F, which is not included in PCV13, but is included in PPSV23. Regarding equity and vaccination coverage, Foreign-born children aged 19 to 35 months of age had significantly lower coverage rates compared to U.S.-born children. In comparing PCV coverage rates for four more doses, na um, fewer Native American children aged 19 to 35 months were up to date when compared to white children in a study in North Dakota. Looking at National Immunization Survey data from 2020, PCV coverage of four or more doses by 24 months of age is low among children who are uninsured, black non-Hispanic, living in a non-metropolitan statistical area, or living in the lowest federal poverty, poverty level. The work group determined that recommended PCV15 would probably increase equity. It should be noted that the work group was split in responses with some voting for probably no impact, which is likely due to uncertainty regarding whether PCV15 use will improve health equity compared to PCV13 use. This table outlines the work group's interpretation for the ETR domains presented today uh, for each policy question, which are the columns. In summary, the work group determined that pneumococcal disease is of public health importance in children. Regarding benefits and harms, the work group determined that desirable anticipated effects are moderate and undesirable anticipated effects are minimal. They determined that using PCV15 was favorable compared to PCV13, but as previously noted, the option favors intervention gave the impression that a preferential recommendation was being proposed when the intention was to assess whether PCV15 can be used as an option in addition to PCV13. Their overall certainty of evidence regarding vaccine effectiveness uh, for routine use in children less than two was moderate. Indirectness was downgraded once to serious due to lack of data on correlates of protection for some critical outcomes considered. Regarding children 2 to 18 years of age when uh, with underlying medical conditions, overall certainty for vaccine effectiveness was 3 low. Indirectness was downgraded once to serious due to absence of data on correlates of protection for some critical outcomes considered, and imprecision was downgraded once to serious due to small sample size. Overall certainty for safety was too moderate for routine use in children less than two years, with imprecision downgraded once to serious due to few events of the outcome being reported. For children with underlying medical conditions, overall certainty of evidence for safety was three low. Imprecision was downgraded twice to very serious, once due to no events of the outcome being reported, and again for very small sample sizes. Regarding values and preferences, the work group agreed that the target population probably feels that the desirable effects from vaccination are large relative to undesirable effects. Additionally, the work group determined that there is probably not important uncertainty or variability in how people value the main outcomes. Lastly, the work group determined that recommending PCV15 would probably increase equity. I'd like to thank the many groups and individuals for their contribution. Thank you. And I will now open up the presentation for discussion. 
Thank you. This uh, presentation is now open for questions, and uh, uh, thank you for the really um, thorough overview. Uh, first, we'll go to Ms. Bata. Thank you, uh, Ms. Farrar. I really appreciate the, the, the nicely uh, laid out uh, presentation. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the discussion of determining that equity would be increased if we've got, um, is it because of we've got another uh, product that can be used? Um, do we know um, why there's a disparate rate? Um, is it because of access? Um, and if so, how would equity be um, increased? Hi, uh, this is Dr. Kobayashi, I'm the um, work group lead. Um, and yes, uh, so as um, um, Jennifer mentioned in her presentation, the work group responses were split quite um, across the options. Um, but then the one that had the um, highest number of votes was uh, the one that was presented, um, that's presented here probably increased. And the thought is that, yes, when you look at the um, IPD rates between uh, race, uh, what we presented today was black and white race the incidence uh, due to the two additional um, serotypes included in PCB15 is different, uh, yet um, you know, the, it, it provides an opportunity to you know, prevent more disease uh, with the additional serotype included. Um, and by having that product and preventing more disease, uh, having the opportunity to prevent more disease in general, uh, the thought was, you know, maybe uh, there is a possibility that it might improve equity, hence um, that was the largest one. But I, I would like to um, emphasize that there, there were opinions um, suggesting different um, options. Um, but then the one that ended up having, you know, the most you know, number of uh, respondents was this probably increased. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, and thank you for that presentation. I'm, I'm just a bit surprised about um, the suggestion that it would just be an option rather than a preferential, um, because if it has two additional um, serotypes, to me, it would, and it's safe, and and the immunogenicity data are supportive of, um, of benefit, even though agree that uh, they have, you know, it would be difficult to look at invasive disease. Um, it just surprises me that it would not be preferential. And with the coming of these newer, you know, today is the 15 to, you know, later will be the 20. I can see where PCV13 won't even, may not even be made anymore. But anyway, I would favor a preferential. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to ask if Dr. Paling wants to respond to anything. Uh, yes, I would love to respond. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez, for that important comment. Um, the, um, to have a preferential recommendation, you need to have comparison of clinical outcomes. And we only have immunogenicity data. And for that reason, um, the work group um, acknowledges um, the data and that this is going to be an option. Um, that's what's driving it. Um, the, um, I want to respond to um, Ms. Bata as well because the equity uh, domain was a very important domain of discussion. And um, there was, as Dr. Kobayashi said, a lot of uh, differing opinions. Some people felt that if the um, here type three, um, if the enhanced immunogenicity actually leads to more protection that could improve equity. Other people were, um, uh, had, were more concerned about that data. So there was variation in opinion. I hope that is helpful. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, um, I had a question about this um, this issue of fever that we talked about a little bit earlier. Did did the work group discuss um, any concern about the idea that um, two mo two month olds may get a high enough fever that then they present and have a septic workup? 
Hi, this is Dr. Kobayashi. Uh, we did not specifically talk about um, that point in the discussion. Uh, Dr. Palin? Yeah, we didn't talk about that, but we also didn't see a difference between PCV13 and 15 in those young children. And so that also drove that decision. Um, is there something in particular that you saw that we want to pay attention to? Thank you. Well, I mean, I, th I think there's obviously there's there's lots of supportive data and the differences were small. I was just struck by two aspects of the prior presentation. One was that there were two um, serious adverse events in the PCV15 group. And the reason they were serious was because they had a fever and then presented and then were admitted to the hospital for that fever and zero in the PCV13 group. And then also even recognizing that the sample sizes were different, it seems like there might be uh, some imbalance in a little bit higher fever in the older kids, which potentially could lead to febrile seizures and also not. I'm just, I'm just saying I, it's an area that I think we should pay attention, pay attention to. And I would appreciate the work group, you know, uh, discussing and considering in the context of everything else. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Maldonado. Yes. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, you for <coughs> good, great discussion, the really nice overview um, and I uh, wanted to just comment specifically about the introduction and what Dr. Paling mentioned. And um, on behalf of the uh, Committee on Infectious Diseases for the American Academy of Pediatrics, we, we agree that uh, whatever the outcome of this uh, vote uh, will be in the future, we are um, appreciative and uh, uh, approve of the remaining uh, pneumococcal vaccination dosing or schedule. So no changes to those uh, dosing or schedule changes, and particularly given the equity data, which again, this is not new, it's been pretty persistent over many years, that uh, underserved or diverse or vulnerable populations tend to have uh, lower um, uh, uh, vaccination rates for the three plus one. And so we appreciate and, uh, and, and, uh, and recommend uh, this strong consideration to leave the doser schedule intact at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions on the ETR presentation? Okay, I do not see any additional hands raised. Um, so I believe, um, Dr. Kobayashi, we can uh, move ahead to your uh, summary and additional discussion of the uh, anticipated um, issues. Okay, thank you. On behalf of the pneumococcal vaccines work group, I will present our next steps. As we discussed in today's presentations, the policy questions on PCV15 use in children are shown here. PCV15 is being considered currently as an option to PCV13 for children who are currently recommended to receive PCV13 either routinely or in series with PPSV23 in children with underlying medical conditions. In today's session, we presented data on the epidemiology of pneumococcal disease and vaccine preventable disease burden for invasive pneumococcal disease, pneumonia, and acute otitis media. The immunogenicity and safety data from phase two and three studies for PCV15. And we used grade and evidence to recommendations or ETR framework to summarize the evidence and work group interpretation on the following ETR domains public health problem, benefits and harms, values, and equity. In future work group meetings, the work group members will review the expected public health impact and cost effectiveness of PCV15 use in children. We will summarize the work group's interpretation of the remaining ETR domains, including resource use, acceptability, and feasibility, and will update the work group's interpretation for other domains if indicated. The work group will also review data to inform clinical guidance for PCV15 use, such as use of PCV15, uh, 15, um, such as use of um, in children who are incompletely or completely vaccinated with PCV13. Additional data will be summarized and presented at the June ACIP meeting, along with policy options on PCV15 use in children for consideration for a vote. 
Here are questions for the committee, uh, which are, does the committee agree with the policy questions being considered by the work group? And are there additional data the committee would like to see before deciding on policy options for a vote? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we might have lost you, or you might have. Just oh no! I, I, uh, that that was the end of my presentation. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, could you please put up the two questions? That would be um, terrific. And I want to make sure that we open this uh, back up for committee members to please comment at, um, uh, at uh, on these two questions here. Um, and some of our members are having uh, some audio issues. So um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll ask Ms. McNally if she could uh, please go ahead and offer her comments. Thank you. Can we go back one slide, please? One more, please. What I'm trying to understand is for this particular recommendation, would it be up to the provider to determine whether they would carry this or the PVC 13. Thank you. Uh, so if um, PCV 15 will be considered as an option to PCV 13 uh, for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine uh, back administration, then yes, um, that would be up to the providers to decide which product to carry. So I'm trying to understand how parents will be educated about the difference and be able to determine what they want for their kids. So yes, apologies. I think your question was um, the, uh, the parents being concerned about given to options. And I, I just wanted to, uh, and I'm happy, you know, because we are still reviewing the remainder of the ETR domains with the work group, uh, we're happy to um, bring that for discussion. And then um, since there was another comment about uh, the policy option to be considered, you know, we're happy to you know, revisit that uh, with the work group. But um, I, I do think that there are precedents with other uh, vaccines, such as um, HPV, where uh, different valency uh, vaccines had been in the market. So uh, this situation will not be unique to the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Um, thank you. And in response to um, Veronica's comment, I think it goes back to the preferential or not. And I understand that since there's no um, invasive data, mm -hmm. but um, it just, I guess it doesn't make much sense on a practical basis. And I think that uh, ultimately providers will want to know um, that it may be an option to use one or the other, but that um, there may be benefits otherwise too, including more stereotypes. It, I understand the preferential issue, but I think at the same time, we have to have some guidance. Okay. Thank you for your comment. You, Dr. Sanchez. Yes. Dr. Long. Yes, I, I'm a member of this uh, August uh, work group, so I haven't said anything here. I've had lots of opportunity to ask all my usual questions. So uh, I, I understand uh, how the committee members are thinking. At the same time, I think we have to remember that the majority of invasive pneumococcal disease currently occurring is due to serotypes that are in the currently available vaccine that this vaccine theoretically increases coverage for 17% of invasive disease. We don't know, however, as you just continue to add serotypes, what will be, what will be the impact or unintended consequences on both colonization or on um, uh, the serotypes that we already have good clinical evidence of superb efficacy with uh, the existing uh, vaccine. And the equity issue, so I, I and there are only 4,300 infants 
in the safety studies and I have the same considerations and concerns that I don't think we saw the data exactly this way to ask the critical questions about those high fevers in the um, PCV15 group that would not be explained by concurrent MMR and V since these were fevers in the first week. So I think we have a little bit more work to do. As far as the equity was concerned, I think our, when, when you're talking about a very small part of the problem that remains, but that those two serotypes we really have discounted thinking about three because uh, the suggestion is you would need to have a lot more antibody to three to have uh, expected clinical impact. So that is just a complete unknown. So we really are only talking about these two serotypes. So if we ask the question about who is getting invasive pneumococcal disease with those two serotypes, we would expect that that would be a little more common in black compared with white as all invasive pneumococcal disease was um, before we had pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. So that's why the little bit of discrepancy of how much would it impact equity, it would only be if there was a little bit of difference in um, the number of cases presented of those two um, serotypes. Um, and the other, there was one other thing I wanted to comment on, but I, I still think we do have work to do. I, I certainly would not be in, in favor of preferentially approving a vaccine just because it contained more serotypes. I mean, look at pneumococcal 23 contains more serotypes. And I'm, I know that's not what Dr. Sanchez meant, but um, we don't know if there will be a tipping point for what happens in the ecology of the nasal pharynx because pneumococcus has had a spot there forever. What will replace it, how things will impact, we don't know until we use these vaccines. So I think caution would be the way to go. And parents would not need to make a decision on what is best for their children. I think if it is this committee's um, uh, ultimate vote that these are two different uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, not different enough to uh, make one preferred over the other. Um, that parent, we don't think that parents would need to try to decide what is best for their children, but doctors could carry what works best for their practice. Thank you, Dr. Long. Uh, that was uh, extremely helpful. Dr. Lair. Thank you for this presentation. I'm just trying to clarify for myself, so I might be thinking out loud a little bit. When we had a new hepatitis B vaccine, we didn't vote on it because it was just going to fit into the schedule. This isn't a new PCV13 vaccine, so we do need to vote on it and approve it and say how it should be used. So I think we do need to say that we think that this is a good vaccine and should be used. Um, and I think that's what the vote would be in June. Am I missing something? It's just a regular routine vaccine approval? Over. Um, yeah, th thank you for your question. E yes, you know, that is correct. Uh, so the intent is to look at, you know, whether this vaccine, you know, can be recommended for use for uh, children. Did that answer your question, or am I going in and out? <laughs> no, thank you. That answered my question. So okay. we have to approve this vaccine, and then later on, the work group will tell us whether they think it should be preferred, and we would decide as a ACIP whether we think it should be preferred. But that'll be more information will be coming when we get to that point in the vote. Thank you. Any other um, comments from uh, committee members? I'll uh, 
um, add my uh, comments regarding these two questions. So um, agree that the policy questions seem very appropriate. Uh, and I think the, um, you know, I'm, I wonder a little bit about the uh, high risk populations uh, and the data that is uh, graded at level three, which makes complete sense to me, uh, but just wondering if it is possible that the, um, the work group discussed whether or not those differences were felt to be meaningful uh, for high risk kids. Um, so I, I don't know if that came up during the discussions or if uh, the work group would be able to comment on that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. So um, just to clarify your question, um, it was about what the work group thought about the, um, the rating of the two questions or certainty of evidence rating for the two studies that were considered for uh, ch children with underlying conditions and uh, what the interpretation of that summary finding was. Is that correct? Yes, and I think my question is uh, less about the grade itself and a little bit more about the um, difference, potential difference uh, in immunogenicity, at least for a subset of those serotypes, and whether or not that had any um, uh, clinical meaning to the work group members uh, to suggest we should think about it a little bit differently in the um, high-risk population versus the healthy population. Thank you. Um, thank you for the clarification. So um, there were there were no specific concerns raised about whether this vaccine uh, would work differently in this population, if, if that was um, what you were asking. Um, however, um, given that it, you know, based on the available data for this uh, population, you know, at least um, the data suggested that it, the efficacy might be comparable to what's observed um, from PCV13 use in this population. Um, but I will say that uh, we also, the work group also reviewed data on vaccine effectiveness of PCV13 um, because the comparison was to uh, P uh, with uh, PCV13. And then um, PCV13 uh, vaccine effective da data in children with underlying condition was um, quite limited. Thank you. Are there additional um, questions, comments, or suggestions the committee members have uh, with regard to uh, anticipating a future vote and uh, whether or not any other um, policy options or data need to be considered aside from what was already mentioned today? Okay, any um, liaison members? Have any questions? Okay, I don't see any additional hands raised. Um, with that, uh, Dr. Kobayashi and Dr. Peeling and colleagues who spoke um, uh, presented today, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, and I also just you know want to recognize this work group for all the uh, work it's done. And I have to say, like, I think the pneumococcal recommendations for both adults and kids continue to be the more complicated of all of our recommendations. So appreciate you continuing to try and harmonize and streamline uh, across the board because, um, you know, the, our goal is really to not only make these recommendations, but to ease implementation considerations uh, to ensure that our uh, children and adults remain uh, highly vaccinated. So thank you. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions or hands raised. So um, Dr. Wharton, is there any further business uh, that we have to address today? Uh, Dr. Lee, thank you. There's no additional business. So I think the committee can be adjourned. Terrific. You know, thank you again to everybody for all your work over the past two days and for all the work preceding this public ACIP meeting. Um, oh, Dr. Maldonado, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the vaccine workers who were killed in Afghanistan this last week, uh, the polio vaccine workers who were shot as part of their um, uh, uh, unrelenting efforts to uh, eradicate polio. And I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge their services to the world and to our children around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Um, 
Yes, there are many people to recognize this week. <laughs> and I uh, want to just say that, um, again, the uh, work begins uh, with uh, the recommendations and really, um, but really doesn't get to individuals until we get through on um, implementation. And so um, supporting implementation efforts is critical. Uh, any other objections to adjourning today's meeting? Okay, hearing none, today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned. Thank you everybody for your time today and I hope you have a wonderful day.